All right, so today's big idea is that we're going to start looking at a way to save more complex data in our apps besides the simple localhost method that we learned previously. Localhost was just basically saving a cookie with a value. And that uh, could get us pretty far, but um, if any of you have experience with other database schema like uh, MySQL, MongoDB, etc., etc., you might see that local storage is a bit limited. So what we'll do is, we I've teased it a little bit before, but this time we'll get into it in detail. So first let's open up our web browser. And let's go to pouchdb.com. PouchDB, that's their icon. It's supposed to look like a pouch, but to me it looks like a green pig or something. It's supposed to be a kangaroo. Kangaroo. Oh, that makes sense. Kangaroos have pouches. <laughs> uh, I thought it was like a little pouch, like from a classic, you know, D and D or some RPG or something. Yeah, kangaroo. Uh, so, PouchDB, the database that syncs. It's an open source. JavaScript database inspired by Apache CouchDB that is designed to run well within the browser. Uh, help, it was created to help web developers build applications that work well offline as well as online. And that's the big thing that we've been talking about uh, that'll come into play even more, that if you're building an app and you want it to save some data and you want it to be able to go from device to device or user to user, there has to be some sort of cloud infrastructure. So this can work with or without cloud infrastructure. Without the cloud, it's going to save all of your database to the device itself, technically to the web browser. It's running in the web browser, so if you load up a project uh, in Firefox, or Chrome or whatever, each web browser is creating a database um, where it can save a variety of types of data. Uh, actually, of a, a variety of data, but of a type of string. Uh, and then when we use it on a mobile device, it's being saved to the mobile device itself. So we haven't quite fully experimented with this concept, but remember when we were working last month with uh, trying to save our name. Our name uh, when you customized it. If you were to close the web browser and come back, it would have forgotten your name. So we did local storage and then it remembered your name. Uh, the same thing happens with the app, that if you were running the app and then you uh, force quit the app or, or fully quit the app, it would forget what was what variables it had uh, unless you use something like local storage. Well, local storage gives, gets us to limitations, so now CouchDB lets us save more data. Uh, it enables the application to store data locally while offline, then synchronize it with CouchDB and compatible servers when the application is back online, keeping the user's data in sync no matter where they next log in. And that's what any good modern app does. You know, I created a, a Facebook account, on an old uh, phone and then I got a new phone and I just log in and my data is there because it's all up in the cloud. Uh, so we're going to shift uh, gears a little bit. We're going to learn uh, enough of Couch D uh, PouchDB to be able to do what, what, what my concept is. Once we learn that, then we'll get into Eclipse and integrate it into our app. Uh, but recently, this is a project that's been uh, uh, in, in updates uh, for a while and it's at version 3.06 at the moment and uh, I recommend beside what we're going to learn that you on your own also start to look at the blog and the API and the and the learn section so that you can see what you can do with this so let's check it out like this let's click here where it says learn more Uh, 
Uh, it goes on to say that it's compatible with most web browsers, Firefox, etc., etc., and also uh, Android and uh, Safari. Now notice, it says Android 4.3 and higher. And then Safari, or iOS for Safari, uh, version 7. Now, it does say that Pouch is experimental with, ver with Android 2.x and various other mobile environments. And so I've tested it, and it, notice it specifically mentions Apache Cordova. It is known to work, but you may run into issues. So this opens up the, this big can of worm about... Um, I saw recently uh, some search results about what's more popular, people um, searching for learn how to program as opposed to something like learn how to make an app. Learn how to make an app is getting much higher search results and traffic than learn how to program, even though learning how to make an app is learning to program. So when you think about, I want to make an app, uh, you have to decide, well, what do you want to do? What's the goal of the app? Not just because I want to get on the, on the Google Play Store and be rich. Like what, what, do you, what is your app going to do that the other apps don't do? Uh, you're going to make another photo app? Okay, good luck. There's already a hundred of them. You're going to make another calculator app? Good luck. There's a thousand of them. Um, you're going to make another fart app? Well, no one wants those anymore. Um, what is your app going to do? What, what, what's, what's your point? Is it like a company uh, intranet app? That's very uh, feasible. You know, is your company saving data? Uh, Julia, who isn't here today, has a very cool idea for an app where she collects uh, data for, um, uh, you know, she work, I think she says she works with a youth group and they do exercise and activities and all of that, and it's to track for the student themselves to track, I did 10 push-ups today, or I ran the, the mile in, uh, in 16 minutes, and etc. So what, is, what does that app do? Something attainable. When people come in here and they think, well, I want to make the next Facebook, um, maybe, if you take this class several times plus many more classes. <laughs> So we have to be realistic in a way about what do we want to accomplish when we want to make an app. So my concept is, uh, in, in our app, um, we are eventually, let me load it up here, we are going to continue to work on our app, and so that what it does is, notice that our, our app has been uh, a showcase for our college uh, and it it shows classes um, you know class explanations and such uh, calendar of events um, we started to play with what can we do with you know the device itself take a photo but how, how would that actually work with a real with a real app like ours? Uh, we have this customization, get directions, that's useful for people. Uh, so what we're going to add to the app is that uh, a student will be able to have uh, their own like note system where these are the classes I want to take, or these are the classes I have taken, that data that they can, uh, that they can, that they can store, so that then uh, they're working toward taking these seven classes, and once they're done, they you know, you check them off, you're done taking the classes, that sort of thing. To, to, so to save classes that you have uh, enrolled in or want to enroll in, that's what our concept is going to be. Um, and so that's doable with, with the amount of time we have uh, in, in these classes. And that's doable with uh, learning a brand new concept, which is databases. That in and of itself, itself could be a whole... Yeah. Uh, you know, six-week class, eight-week class, just database stuff. So that's how we're going to use PouchDB. Uh, so it's based on stuff you've already learned. It's it's going to be JavaScript running in HTML. We're, we're not going to need to learn, you know, uh, SQL commands and all of that. So notice here under Learn More how to install it. Well, we need a reference to the Pouch. JavaScript library. So that'll be easy. We're going to download the file in a moment and then create a simple HTML document and then we're going to start to put together an interface where a student can fill 
in the name of a class, then the instructor, you know, data, and then save it to the database, and then retrieve it with the press of a button and such. All of that will be basically JavaScript commands, and the JavaScript commands will make sense because we've got we're going to have this reference to the PouchDB code. Uh, notice you can also install it via Node. And then using it, there's tutorials and the documentation. Um, let's take a look here. If you're under this Learn section, let's look at the uh, Frequently Asked Questions, the FAQ. So these are some questions that often get asked. For example, can PouchDB sync with MongoDB or MySQL or my current non-CouchDB database? In short, no. Um, PouchDB runs, if you're going to have some sort of cloud backend, it runs on CouchDB. So this might not be um, the answer to your issue. If you've got some sort of cloud infrastructure and you're running MySQL or MongoDB or something, uh, this might not work uh, to do the, the duplication of the database and such. So there are, uh, of course, links all over the place to guide you. Well, what what can I do with it with my infrastructure? So you want to look at that on your own. What can uh, PouchDB sync with? Well, it talks about CouchDB, of course, Cloud and Iris Couch, etc. A PouchDB server and all the documentation is there to set it up. Again, this, as I said, it's a can of worms with a can of worms inside of it. It's it's a lot of stuff to do to get this all to work. That's why you know there's a room full of engineers on all of the on all of the companies that run. Um, apps because there's so much that could go wrong and so much to to make to make work. It talks about well, it's web-based, but can I build a native app from it? And it talks about yes. And then here are some examples and such. How much data can PouchDB store? That's a good question because when we were looking at local storage, uh, by default it would save about five megabytes of data. Nowadays isn't so much, but traditional cookies would only ser save about a hundred kilobytes of data, a fraction. But when we get more complicated, uh, we want to save more. Here's where the limits come in. Uh, it talks about, for example, if you're if if a person connects to this via Firefox, um, you've got 50 megabytes, and then it can be expanded, and the and the expansion is unlimited. If you're running uh, Chrome, it calculates the amount of available storage on the user's hard drive. So it, take, it can take up as much space as the person's hard drive. It talks about Opera, Internet Explorer, and then it talks about mobile Safari and Android. Android works the same as Chrome, while older versions can store up to 200 megs. So if we're running a, a newer version of Android, uh, it should work like Chrome, which is it'll try to take as much of, the, of, your, of your onboard storage as possible. But if you're running an older version, under 4.4, it can take up to 200 megabytes of data. And, and that's a lot for what we're going to need it for. We're just going to use, we're going to be saving text data. Uh, in PhoneGap, you can have unlimited data by using the SQLite plugin. So there we can, act, we can actually use uh, SQL commands and such if, if, you're, if you're versed in that. Talks about upgrading. Um, the short answer is that I wouldn't upgrade any app that I'm working in at the time that I'm working on it. If it's if it's complete and if it's been released, okay, then I'll set across set upon the task of upgrading it to upgrading my infrastructure. But while we're working on the app, I think that's part of the problem from last week, where or not last week, but last Tuesday, that we've been working with 2.9 and I wanted to go to the next version and then you, there's bugs that happen once in a while so uh, we're gonna stick with 2.9 um, how is pouch different from couch Well, you can read about that but um, again this is gonna be technical as this stuff usually is but I've got uh, a project that is gonna uh, be uh, very doable uh, hands-on and I said we're gonna collect data we're gonna save it to the database we're gonna retrieve it and we're gonna taste of, get a taste of it uh, overall, all of these three classes, yes, it is level one, two, and three, but hopefully you don't have the idea that we're going to create the next Facebook throughout the whole three months. You know, it doesn't take three months. It takes, it takes a long time. Question.
Yes, but with any sort of database, it, uh, I don't think they really come pre-populated anyway. You have to set up the, the well, database. I mean, as in, as in like, they pre-populate them, and then they, like, whatever the user chooses to input that, and they select something we already put in there. Sure. Sure. When we set up our database and everything, we can load in our own records, and then it'll be populated already for people to, to use as example data. Sure. So let's look at um, let's look at the API documentation. This is the whole manual for for Pouch DB. So on the left side or at the top, select API. It's the application programming interface. This is like this explains everything how it all works. So when the question is why does it do that, this is the answer because the people that created it said this is how you do it. So most of Pouch DB is exposed as some sort of function, an argument, um, options, and a callback function, where both the options and the callback are optional. So notice that we, we don't always need a callback, meaning a result. Usually we want some sort of result because, for example, plugging in data to a database, well, did it actually work or did it not? And I want to then deal with a positive result or a negative result when both the option and the callback are optional. Callbacks use the function error result idiom where the first argument will be the undefi will be undefined unless there is an error and the second argument holds the result. Uh, so everything that happens basically uh, is going to give you either an error or a result. A result could then range from uh, the data was displayed on screen or the data was put into the database so error or result. Additionally, any method that only returns a single thing, for example, db.get, also returns a promise. Promises come from the minimal library lie in the browser and, fe and the feature-rich bluebird in Node. So again, can of worms inside of a can of worms. A great question last time about, is there some sort of website that has a list of definitions of all of this stuff? If there was, it would be going on and on and on and on, because this stuff always changes, it gets updated, goes extinct, and basically, I go to Wikipedia to look up stuff like, what's a promise in the terms of programming? Um, and notice that the documentation is a bit lengthy. It goes on for a while because it's got examples, which is always great. It goes on for a little while. The left side divides up everything about, well, how do we create databases? How do we delete databases? How do we um, synchronize it, etc. And notice we're going to use the uh, syntax. This is going to be JavaScript. So we're going to write new, a name of a database, in this case, PouchDB. No, actually, that's the command. Uh, PouchDB, and then the name, and then options. This method creates a database or opens an existing one. If you use a URL, then PouchDB will work as a client to an online CouchDB instance. Otherwise, it will create a local database using whatever backend is present. So very cool. We can, we can tell it to uh, create or connect to a database, and it, you can simply connect to one that already exists online by calling its web address. Yes. When uh, calling an outside line, is there an option also to, uh, let's say, bring over a copy of data that you want to store locally? Um, not sure. I think what we're doing is we're working with it directly, but we can always do replication, make a new database, and make a copy of what already is there to a second one called DB2, for example, and we'll have a copy of it there. So again, all of this stuff here. Uh, then we get, we get the actual example. So notice here. We're going to create a variable, call it whatever we want, db, for example. And then we're going to say, let's create a new instance of pouchdb. What's the internal name? db name, or whatever we want. Or connect to it on, in the cloud. 
on the server. We have different ways that we can create these databases and this is going to basically work by itself pretty well easily uh, but if we need to specifically create a type of database like a web SQL database or index DB database different types of databases we can tell it what kind we can say well make it a web SQL type of database we don't really need to do that it'll create the proper one based on the device that we set this up on deleting the database examples there and we're going to talk about uh, adding a document maybe you could also call it a, a record um, uh, or a table create or update a document so that's going to be db.put with a variety of, of uh, parameters uh, well what does that mean we're going to talk about um, uh, a, a user, a student can can save the the class number, the class name, and the uh, instructor's name. Those three bits of data uh, would be a document. Each one would be a document. We can put them all together as one type of record because also what works here is a JSON format where we can have multiple uh, bits of data together. So notice here, um, create a new doc with an ID. So we're saying db.put. And we've got title, colon, heroes. Uh, and then it ends here, comma, the rest of the, um, the rest of put. Or we can do title, Lady Stardust. Notice what we're doing is we're putting uh, one document, a title of something. And you're going to see as we look at the documentation, the, um, the creators of, of, uh, of, of Pouch seem to be David Bowie fans, because we're going to see references to David Bowie songs and, and other, other things like that. So, Lady Stardust. Um, we can update an existing record, or we can be a little bit more complicated in that we can pass in more than one thing at once. Notice here we're passing just one item, the title of a song. Here we've got uh, ID, and then comma, and then revision, and then the actual title. So we can pass in more than one, um, one, more than one field. And then we'll get results back. So we'll see about a difference of uh, put and then post. So every, in order to be able to work with the data that we're putting into the database, it needs some sort of master identifier. So notice in this case, it had said underscore ID and given it um, this other uh, ID number, but if we use DB post, we can let uh, Pouch itself generate an ID. If we do that, though, it'll generate something like that, which of course will be a unique identifier, but since we're letting Pouch do it, you know, we don't have to bother with making our own IDs every time. Uh, the way we're going to do this is we're going to collect, as I said, the data uh, class number, uh, class name and an instructor's name. So the class number will be the unique identifier. So this is going to go on and on, but we're going to we're going to do it ourselves. Uh, as I said, what I've put into if you want to explore it in the um, in the in the Z drive there is an example that we're going to go toward but we're going to create it from scratch together because obviously if you just look at it it's going to be you know 75 lines of code about what does this do so we will do this together but if you want to start looking at it on your own if you're a bit more advanced you're welcome to do that so what we will do then we'll get back to the documentation as necessary what we'll do then is we'll actually start to create this this uh, this simple pouch project so Let's go to the desktop and create a new folder. And let's just call it my pouch db.
And at the moment, I want to focus on, on learning, well, how does Pouch work? So we're going to create a very basic HTML5 file, HTML5 file and then start working with Pouch right away. So open up that folder, and in the blank folder, we can do right-click, New, Text Document, and we're going to just change this to be, um, again, mypouch.html. Go ahead and remove the .txt. It'll complain. Are you sure you want to change that? Yes. And that's just so that we have a blank HTML <coughs> file that now we can edit in a notepad. We could do this, of course, in Eclipse, but Eclipse is a little too bulky to really just write some simple HTML and JavaScript. So just a simple HTML document. Right-click, edit with notepad, plus plus. And so here inside of Notepad++, we will create uh, a very basic HTML5 structure. This will give us a little practice as before. Yes, we could use a template like, like before, but we're just going to you know, create something very basic. Let's go ahead, uh, it's about eight lines. Now in order for anything that we're going to do here to work, we need uh, to reference the uh, PouchDB JavaScript. And since uh, this is eventually going to be integrated into our app. We're going to download the JavaScript library into this folder and then write our JavaScript. So back to uh, Chrome, uh, or back to your web browser, I mean, and back to pouchdb.com, and we have the download button at the top there. So click to download that, and it should give you a file called um, pouchdb-306.min.js. You want to save that. And wherever it got downloaded, you want to put that into this folder where our project is going to live. Download that PouchDB file and put it into the same folder as this brand new file that we just created. No, this one you have to download. So this is what will allow us to, uh, to write this JavaScript that creates and edits databases, and uh, this is what will be the backbone of our, of our app to be able to store some data. So make sure it's in the folder. And then back in Notepad, we're going to say, uh, up on line 4, we're going to write script slash script. And we're going to reference that file that should be in our folder, so that will be src equals quote, end quote, and then pouch db-3.0, not an o, point zero, six dot min dot js.
So once we have that reference, we will be able to do everything that we need. And so I want to create in the body of the page, I want to create some uh, text fields for people to be able to plug in some values. So let's go into body. We're going to create this form tag. I'm going to break it into two lines. A form is um, is a collection of input fields. For example, when you log into your email or to Facebook or whatever, usually there's username, password, and then submit. That's a kind of a form. You're plugging in some data and clicking go or submit or whatever, and then it takes that data and does something with it. So here we're creating a form, and what we want to do with it is a bunch of um, pouch DB manipulation. So up on the form, inside of the form tag, then we'll write action equals quotes, and we'll just put the uh, hash sign at the moment. Traditionally, here is where we would put something like uh, form processor.php or something. This is what would take the data that's in the form and process it via PHP or ASP or some language. But uh, in our case, we're going to leave it like this because we're going to do things differently. And I want to start to build this simple form. I want people to be able to type the CRN number of the class, uh, the class title, and then the instructor, the instructor name. That's the text that's going to appear on screen, but to create the little boxes where people will actually fill in those things, I need a, a new tag here. This is going to be an input field, and then this one is actually singular. It doesn't have a pair, but it does have parameters that say what kind of input field is it. And I'm going to say its type is text. For the three of them, actually. So you can copy and paste. Actually, also, I want to put a break between these, or else these will all be on one line. Remember, HTML doesn't differentiate when you, when you put a enter, you have to either force an enter or put a paragraph or whatever. So we're building a very, very simple thing here. Obviously, um, I'm cutting corners here and there, but don't worry about it. We're going to be focusing on uh, the new PouchDB stuff. So in order for us to really worry about the icing on the cake, don't. Let's worry on the actual cake of the cake. Uh, so let's write something like this, save it and run it. Nothing really happens just yet, but we should at least get some input boxes on screen where you can click and type inside of. Nothing happens yet. But go ahead and um, check your code, see if it looks like this. And when you run it, it should look something like that. Just input boxes where you can start typing stuff, but there's no submit, there's no enter, nothing happens yet. Don't worry, but this is what we need so far. Okay, so you've got some input boxes. Notice this is input type text. We have other types of types that we can make. For example, input type, uh, type equals number will only allow people to write numbers. But we'll leave it as text for the moment. What we also want to do is give each of these input boxes a unique ID. 
That way we can more easily reference it in JavaScript. We're going to write JavaScript that says, okay, whatever the person writes in these boxes, give me what's in the box and put it into the database, in short. In order to be able to access that, we should give these input boxes a unique ID. So after input type text, we'll, we'll say ID. We'll make up some names here, but the names I've got are um, pretty consistent. We'll say CRN field, capital F, and we'll say for the next one, ID title field, and the last one, ID instructor field. The point of these IDs, again, is that when we write JavaScript, the JavaScript will be able to find that element on screen and do something with it. On line 13, let's say people type in, type stuff into these fields, and then so uh, we need a mechanism to input that, a button. So we can write here, and this will be an input. Again, it does not have a pair. We just write input, and then we add in, uh, this time type, button. So this input object will now be a button. Uh, I could make it display whatever text I want in the button by doing value equals. We'll just say go. And notice I wrote capital G. So that's what's going to display on screen. Go. should probably also add a break above that so that the input button is right is not right next to the instructor field I'm going to save this and run it so I can type stuff here and click go. Nothing happens yet because we haven't told the button to do anything yet, but notice we've got, we've got a button. So that's what it looked like, should look like so far. Does it, uh, does it look like that for everyone? Anyone uh, need a little help so far?
All right, so if you've got this, this is the, um, <coughs> the, the beginnings of our input boxes. What I want to happen is that when you click Go, that data gets pulled from these fields and put into a database. We've still got a little way to go, however. Now to see, um, at this point, well, do you, do you, you probably have seen on several times when you're filling out some kind of form online, you make a mistake, you want to you wanna do it over, you want to clear the, the form, let's add that kind of button to, to clear it out. So we'll say here, uh, actually we'll add uh, on line 14, above the, uh, the input, the button that says go, we'll, we'll put a, a new input, new input object, and this time we'll call it type reset. And this means that it's going to create a button that its purpose is automatically to reset the form on the screen. That means we're going to clear it out. Uh, we then want a value, which is what displays on the button itself, and we will just call it uh, clear. So if you were writing this and you say, actually, I don't want what I've typed, click the clear button and it'll clear it out. So it has a default uh, action of doing something? Of reset, exactly, because we've got type reset. The default action is take all the form fields within this form and do you also have a save? <laughs> no, that's the hard one. Question? Well, it may not be what you want to get into, but if not, we'll deal with it later. But uh, normal default browser behavior is if you hit the enter key while you're in the middle of a form, that it will often take the first thing that it sees in the submit button and, uh, and try to do it. So having the clear button be first, does it get triggered? I don't think I, I don't think it's gets triggered because it's in that order. I think it's uh, but neither what we have is a submit button. That's good. Yes. So um, I don't, I didn't know that the default modern behavior is to go to the to the nearest submit button. I think that still itself has to be programmed in. I don't think it's smart enough to know. Or maybe who knows nowadays because the language has progressed. Maybe it now yeah. has an enter built in. But I sort of feel. Probably not. All right, so if we just test this, it won't be very exciting yet, but you start to add stuff into these fields and you click clear and it clears it. Okay, and then the other part about the, the save and the go and all of that, that's the more complicated part. But at least to see if our go button is really doing anything, we could do something, um, um, we could do, we could keep going and then we could see what is it actually? What is it actually going to do? Well, um, 
what I want to do is, for example, maybe display so that we're seeing, is it seeing the stuff I'm putting into the, the field? Maybe just do something very basic here uh, on the Go button. We're going to do this a little better, but on the Go button, we're going to add on click. Remember, on click is an action that happens after you've clicked this button. Simply what I'll do is I'll say alert. I'll make a simple pop-up appear. And I want it to show me the content of the um, uh, of that input box. So inside of the alert, we need to reference that particular ID so we can say document dot get element. Remember this one? Element by ID. Open close parentheses. We need to say what um, what particular ID, and usually we're using the double quotes all the time, but that'll get us into the issue when we've got double quotes inside of double quotes. That, get, that confuses it. So we'll use single quotes here. Single quotes will apply to the get element by ID, and then the double quotes to the whole on click. So we'll say CRN field, the name of the ID that we gave to the first field, CRN field. Specifically then, okay, what about that, that, that field? We're going to then say dot value. Give me the value that people put into, into that box. So here's what I wrote. Save it and run it, put a few things in each of the fields, click go. Hopefully you should get an alert pop-up box. And the value of what's inside the CRN field. If it didn't work, double check your spelling. Remember here, this is a capital E for element and a capital B for by and a capital I for ID. The ID, both of them are not capital, just the I in ID. So notice I type stuff into the three fields, I click go, the alert happens and it shows me the result, the value that's inside of this field. Did, uh, raise your hand if it worked. Cool, raise your hand if it didn't quite work. Anyone need some help? Let's take a look there.
Yeah. 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 So notice uh, what it did was, that's what this code is saying. Give me the value, whatever's in that box. Which box? The one called CRM field. Give it to me and show it on screen. So it only shows one of those three elements. We could make it show all three. We'd have to have, you know, this stuff here, and then the plus symbol, and then show me the next field. And then the plus symbol, show me the next field. So we can add to what's displayed with the plus symbol. Uh, this is just a proof of concept that it seems to be working so far. Uh, this is not exactly what we want it to do, but this is what, uh, what it is so far. So um, we don't need this just yet, but we do need the on click. We'll leave on click for the moment. I'm going to remove that. Just uh, make it just be plain there. You can save it and comment it out if you want, but we don't need it at the moment. Now eventually the concept that's going to happen is people are going to plug in values and I want to get feedback. Right now we did this to get some feedback. Is this working? We want to get some feedback when I plug in the data or when I extract the data. Give me feedback. One simple way we'll do this is we'll have sort of like what we were doing in other parts of the project where, where we had um, a div that had a unique ID. So we'll do that again here. We'll do this after the form, though, so line 17. This is outside of the form now. We're going to create a div. This one's got a pair, of course. And then it needs uh, an ID. I think we've already used message elsewhere, so we shouldn't use it here. Uh, we will call it uh, the result. So this is going to be empty. It's going to be a placeholder. This is uh, this is where it'll give us feedback messages about you know um, malformed data or error messages or uh, the resulting uh, table of of classes. So nothing's inside of the div yet. So here what we've got in the body is basically all that we need. We're going to add one or two more things in a, in a little bit. This is all we need so far. Uh, so now it's going to come to the part about uh, writing some JavaScript so that we can actually start to extract this data, save it in the database, and then display it on screen. So that's going to take us a little bit uh, more work. Let's take a short break at this point, and when we come back we'll start writing JavaScript. So it's 7 o'clock, do 10 minutes. And at 7.10, we'll, we'll continue.